One painting by Velázquez won't be coming to London because it's never allowed to leave Spain. It hangs here in the Prado Museum in Madrid. Las Meninas, or the Maids of Honor, is Velázquez's final masterpiece. But it's a picture which puzzles people to this day. It seems to be a painting of a painting. It shows Velázquez himself in his only certain self-portrait, painting a large canvas of the five-year-old Princess Margarita, who is being waited on by her maids and attendants, and has even brought along her mastiff and her favorite dwarf. But does it? Reflected in the mirror behind the princess are her parents, the king and queen. So perhaps they are the real subject of the canvas Velázquez is painting. Or is Velázquez making the audacious claim that even a lowly painter like himself is entitled to appear in the same picture as the king and queen of Spain? Velázquez came from Seville, on the river Guadalquivir in southern Spain. He grew up here, in the Barrio Santa Cruz, the old Jewish quarter, which had a population of Moors, Gypsies and Spaniards, and had once been home to Seville's large Jewish community. In fact, Velázquez's father's family were almost certainly conversos, or Jews who converted to Christianity in order to escape persecution. Later in life, Velázquez claimed he was descended from nobility, but his father actually worked as a clerk at the cathedral, and the family lived in this small house. At the age of 10, Velázquez was apprenticed to this man, a local painter called Francisco Pacheco, who became his mentor, and eventually his father-in-law. He lived here, with his parents and his six younger siblings. The house is now owned by a pair of clothes designers who live in Madrid and specialize in wedding dresses. Well, it's a little strange seeing all these wedding dresses around, but 400 years ago, this would have been the Velasquez's front room. I suppose what's most remarkable about it is that it survived this long, and that the man who was born here ended up being the greatest painter Spain has ever known, and one of the greatest painters the world has ever known. And there's a sort of haunted feel to this room. I dare say the frocks may give you that impression. Velázquez is a masterful painter of appearances, and yet the marks he makes seem so spontaneous, almost improvised. The effect is astonishingly painterly. And remarkably, he seems to have made no preliminary drawings. From this distance, it's very sketchy. Here, a, 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 the technique of a sketch is being applied to a formal portrait. Exactly. But just walk back a few paces, and all of that sketchiness coalesces into this marvelous vision of this plush fabric, beautifully embroidered in the silver thread, glinting in the light. Is it stupid to say it feels like, like Impressionism, but you must have worked through some of that thinking that, you know, came that much later, you know. It, well, indeed, and he somehow understood that these seemingly random strokes were going to coalesce and work from a distance. Somehow he was working this out for himself. How does he get all that filigree of lace and all that kind of texture and silky shine? And there's nothing, there's a few blobs, a squiggle. 
And I don't know how he did that. I mean, I don't know whether he used long brushes. I just don't know how it's done. It's a sign writing. It's a kind of way of indicating by various shorthand methods, which you know now work at a distance. You know, originally all that drapery and cloth you had to make. Now you can indicate it by just a flick here and a flick there. The young Velasquez's precocious talent was immediately recognized by his master, Pacheco, who later said, I consider it no disgrace for the pupil to surpass the master. Leonardo was none the worse for having Raphael for a pupil. He introduced Velasquez to the rarefied world of connoisseurs like the Duke of Alcala. So it's not really a Moorish, it's what we call Mudejar. Mudejar. Mudejar, Mudejar is an architectural style the Duke lived in a secluded palace, which is like something out of the Arabian Nights. Gosh, impressive, isn't it? <laughs> it is, and it probably was even more at the time uh, of Velázquez. It seems to have been considered like a, a genius and uh, to have been protected by wealthy patrons. The young Velázquez would have been surrounded by rare books, paintings, marbles, and other treasures from classical antiquity. I'm trying to think of this 20-year-old who goes into Pacheco's studio. Mm -hmm. And he got married at 20 to Pacheco's daughter. daughter, daughter. Yes. Coming into this, mm -hmm. it must have been rather astonishing and incredibly privileged Master, to be yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. But Velázquez was always considered a sort of a, a child prodigy. So people must have understood the quality of yeah. his work. Yeah. And people who appreciated work like this yeah could then be his patrons. In fact, his early patrons were all came from the ranks of the nobility. Uh, the Duke Falcala himself owned two paintings. One is two men sitting at a table, and another one is of a woman mashing garlic in a kitchen. So um, it's amazing that these paintings that were regarded as the lowest type of painting were the most appreciated by this uh, sort of very sophisticated upper class. Velázquez's earliest paintings are scenes from the lives of the poorest people in Seville. They were called bodegones because they were set in bodegas or cheap eating places like this one, which is the oldest in Seville. At a time when painting in Spain was restricted almost entirely to religious subjects, Velázquez turns the simplicity of everyday life into something sacred. Here are two women from his own time working on a meal. Beautiful, spare, still life, simple, humble meal of, of fish, eggs, garlic. And is that Christ in the background of that picture? It is. It's Christ in the house of Mary and Martha, and Christ has come to visit them. But here you have this realist coming up with this conceit Yes. where you juxtapose figures from today's world and through a window, through a hatch yes. in the wall, yes. you're looking back on this biblical uh, scene. As you say, a hatch in the wall. And what fascinates me about this is, you know, I keep thinking he's so young. There is this picture of everyday life in Seville, something which others would avoid. There is the context why it's yes. a religious painting because they liked that sort of stuff in Seville. And there is this sort of fantastical element. There, it, you don't know if it's a mirror, if they're sitting, as you say, through a hatch. Historians have argued about this, have whether it's a mirror, whether it's a hatch, or whether it's a picture on the wall. For some, it, 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 it must be a picture on the wall. How can it be real? Here he's declaring, as a teenager, that he's interested in multiple levels of reality. And he's bringing them together in this way.
Velázquez himself valued one of his early paintings above all others, a study of a local water seller with the earthenware jars of his trade. One of the many wonderful uh, elements of this picture that I so like is the way this jar has been painted with the drops of water and the light. You can just feel the curve of the, of the jar, the fact that it's just been used to pour some water and there's some drips coming down the side of the jar. Uh, it just seems to me brilliantly painted. On those different textures of that. And then uh, the other jar there. And of course the transparency and the texture of that glass over there held by that boy. Exactly. Velázquez water cellar now hangs in the Waterloo Gallery in Apsley House, the Duke of Wellington's London home on Hyde Park Corner. How it came to be there is a quite extraordinary story. It was one of a horde of 180 pictures captured during the Peninsular Wars 200 years ago and given to the first Duke of Wellington who liberated Spain from the French. The paintings had been cut out of their frames and were later discovered to have been stolen from the Spanish royal collection. The Duke, who was aware that these pictures had been stolen by the French from Madrid, was very anxious to return them to Spain. And uh, he received the following letter. His Majesty, being the, king of the, the rightful King of Spain, now restored, uh, uh, touched by your delicacy, does not wish to deprive you of that which came into your possession by means as just as they are honourable. So, it, it, once upon a time, this was booty, but then it became a gift, you it mean? It was so absolutely a gift by the restored King of Spain. That The King was determined to give them to the First Duke in gratitude for liberating Spain from the French. And it so happens that this early masterpiece, now in British hands, was also Velázquez's entree to the court of Philip IV. He took the picture with him to Madrid in 1622, hoping to attract the attention of the new king, who'd inherited the throne the year before, at the age of just 16. From the moment he met him until the moment he died, Velázquez's life and his work would be entwined with that of his master, Philip IV, who was, without exaggeration, the most powerful ruler on earth. Philip IV was the heir to the great Habsburg dynasty. He was the ruler of the largest empire in the world and the defender of the Catholic faith against heresy and Protestantism. His grandfather, Philip II, had built the Escorial, a massive granite fortress which took 20 years to construct. This was just the king's private chapel. The Habsburgs lived in a series of lavishly decorated palaces in and around Madrid. They were seen as superhuman, almost divine beings. And the scale and opulence of their surroundings was intended to strike awe into mere mortals. And you know something? It does. The Royal Mausoleum is designed to demonstrate that the Habsburgs were as grand and as powerful in death as they were in life. Velázquez himself supervised the design and decoration towards the end of his life. And here are all the Philips. Philip II, who started to build this mausoleum. Philip III and Philip IV, Velázquez's patron, who completed it. Philip IV was six years younger than Velázquez and sat for him for the first time when he was just 18. In 1623, Velázquez was appointed royal painter, 
and was chosen by Philip IV to be the only artist allowed to paint his portrait from life. What do you make of this portrait, Tom? Philip's stiff and awkward, yes. isn't he? Yeah. He's there, I'm the king, and I'm having my portrait painted. Exactly. Very, you know, but at the end, you know, if you take the transition bit by bit, I'm the king sitting down with Velasquez, I know him very well, let's relax. I can imagine that, uh, apart from the courtesies that were necessary and the bowing and scraping, it was a pretty natural process. But uh, Philip IV isn't in a relaxed place, nor is Velasquez. So, you know, it's a tight as a tick, that court. And uh, everybody's got their part and their lines drawn up and what you say in certain circumstances. So to get that natural, that relaxed, that just looking at somebody instead of looking like the king, I think the king is letting him do that, and the king is not putting up a barrier of kingliness. And the thing that makes his visage different from any other is how luminous it is. Here is this perfect quasi-divine being, and he shows it in this way in paint. Philip was known for his poker face. He was known for this inscrutable expression, and it was described by ambassadors who would come and the king would greet them and they, he would, they would get virtually no response whatsoever. This was part of his image uh, as the king, of course, and Velasquez captures that, that bit of reality, um, and, and makes the most of it. He's, he's distant, he's a bit removed from the real world. Velasquez was also expected to paint the king in ways which would enhance his authority and prestige. He paints Philip IV as a confident ruler whose mastery of his horse symbolizes his control of the biggest empire on earth. His horse is performing a complicated classical step called a lavade which is still being taught at the Royal Riding School in Jerez. Horsemanship was regarded as an essential part of the education of a prince, like Philip's son, Baltazar Carlos. Oh, my God! watch the skill of these riders and of these animals. Oh, my God. Amazing. Velasquez portrays the heir to the throne, controlling his horse with just one hand. Even at the age of five, he seems miraculously endowed with the qualities of a future king. This is exactly the kind of place that the young Baltazar Carlos would have come to learn to ride and to gain the essential attributes of a prince to hold on to the reins of power. His horse is also doing a levade, and improbably but gloriously, both rider and horse appear to be in flight. The levade is one of the classical jumps on the classical school of riding. It takes years of training. The horse that we're going to see now is 10 years old and he's been training since he was four years old. Now that is incredible. First we train the horse to do the levat on the ground. And once the horse is very well trained on uh, riding every day, every day, then some of them, they can do it the on, on, with the rider on. And it takes a lot of years till he gets the position perfect to don't disturb the horse and help the horse to be sit and to stay for some seconds in this position. So it's, it's pretty tough to do it. Yeah, it takes a long time, yeah. The young prince occupied a uniquely privileged place in the hierarchy of the court. But lower down, there was a host of minor characters. The court isn't complete without this whole cast of people. 
everybody has a place of necessity and because it's a very close court in a very uh, you know, stifling kind of atmosphere, Velasquez can walk around those corridors and he knows everybody's place and everybody's character and what they're up to and what they have to do and will reveal that because you know, they'll look at him. Velázquez painted an unforgettable series of portraits of some of the oddest individuals in the strange, closed world of the court. These paintings are especially haunting because their subjects seem so vulnerable. Velázquez's most intriguing portraits are of the royal dwarfs, all of whom are quite easily identifiable because they were, in their way, minor celebrities. Dwarfs were seen as rare marvels of creation. They were the companions and playmates of the royal children. Velázquez paints them without any sentimentality, as individuals in their own right. There is nothing cloying or patronizing about these paintings. They are powerful and affecting. It's an extraordinary cast of characters, isn't it? I mean, they must have really trusted him. Well, he, he had the lineup that he had and used it brilliantly. I mean, he was the person that bothered with these people. So all these people that he could be one after the other as he looked at them, because he, he was one of them. He imagined them brilliantly. Shakespeare seems to imagine immediately what it's like to be anything and then to be it. And Velasquez makes people make the faces that they do make when they are these things. Philip IV was so fond of the pictures of the royal dwarves that he hung them alongside family portraits in his private hunting lodge in the mountains outside Madrid where he would go to indulge his passion for hunting red deer and wild boar. Only the male members of the king's family and a small number of favored courtiers were allowed to visit the hunting lodge. And Velasquez's informal, private portraits would have been seen by very few people. This is Philip's younger brother, Ferdinand, a fine shot, who later became a cardinal. His young son, Baltazar Carlos, holds a miniature rifle and has clearly exhausted the hound which sleeps at his feet. I wonder what it's like to hunt wild boar. How big is this estate, this... Uh, El Hoyo is uh, probably the second estate in, in Spain. What are these for? Uh, we call zajones or delanteras in Spanish. And this is made from leather, from the cow or uh, skin of deer. Yep. And protects you against the bush and also against the tusk of the boars. The tusk of the boars? Yes. So I'm well prepared then. Yeah. <laughs> Are these hunting dogs? Yes. In the 17th century, kings no longer went to war. They relied on their generals to lead their troops into battle. So hunting became a kind of surrogate warfare in which the king could exhibit his bravery. The current king of Spain, Juan Carlos, often hunts on this estate. I'm taking you up to Cons One Conservation Studio Number One, and we're going to have a look at Velasquez's boar hunt. <laughs> Velasquez.
Velasquez painting of a royal boar hunt was badly damaged and has been painstakingly restored by the conservation department at the National Gallery. How long has that been there? About 18 months, I think. Wow. About six months cleaning and uh, about a year's restoration on and off. I, I notice this little figure here, which is so delicate. And yet I do get absolutely the sensation of his speed, that he's, he's rushing over to do something. Those are the same, the same dogs in the paintings. The, what are they called? Alanos. Alanos. With this picture, which has been unevenly overcleaned, parts of it are absolutely fine. I mean, the three figures... Um, centre bottom, the, the, the black, red and grey one. Um, the, uh, those three, for oh, instance, those three figures, are yeah. in pretty good shape, partly because they're more thickly painted, but the figures under the trees are very, very thinly painted, and about half of them has probably been cleaned off half the thickness of paint. I've actually put a little bit back. Um, are you allowed to do that? Well... <laughs> within reason. Within reason. I mean, it's a very... With, with reason. With reason, yes. Do you have to have a witness in the room? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Wild boar coming over there. You can see the, you can hear the dogs barking. Yeah. You can yeah. see it's coming out. Yeah. Is Philip here in the picture? Philip is most definitely here. He's right there. He's the one taking on yeah, the charging you know, board. Even from here. Yes. I can see his face. And, when and with the fewest amount of strokes. Exactly. Just right. a few, few strokes. <laughs> What's unusual here is that normally the protagonists, the, the principal figures in the painting, were depicted right down front, right in the front plane, so you could recognize them. There was the king, there were, there were the king's brothers, or, or whoever. And in this case, he's foregrounding incidental activity. He's, he's fascinated with things going on on the periphery. The king doesn't need to be down front. He's the king, and his image alone is enough to proclaim his majesty. I still wonder why a 17th century Spanish court artist is so many people's candidate for the greatest painter of all time. Not living here. Manet called Velázquez the painter's painter. Among his admirers today is John Curran, whose ironic contemporary take on figurative painting has made him one of the most successful artists in New York. Why is he so much a painter's painter? The technique is, is so extraordinary and seemingly accessible. It seems to be that, oh, he just sort of decided to paint this painting and, and mix the color and put it on a, on a brown ground. And, and that's all there is to it. And then you try it, and, and of course it doesn't, it doesn't work. And, and in fact, great painters have tried it, and, and it doesn't work for them either. So something was happening that's incredibly mysterious. Even though there's this astonishing variety of, of, of textures and, and brush strokes and everything, it doesn't seem um, showy. <laughs> I mean, it, it's actually incredibly, still incredibly reserved somehow. I mean, I, calling it a skill kind of brings it down a bit. I mean, it, it's skill to a, such a level that's inconceivable, I think, for a normal person. It's skill at the level of genius. You know, I, I don't know. That is his genius. It's skill that's inconceivable, I think, for another, any other person. What about, then, the emotional impact of this on you? What, what's, what does it feel like when you're standing in front of those pictures? I find that the kind of emotional visual effect is... is, is strange in the extreme. There is a kind of imperious and frightening remoteness. What do you mean by that? It's a show of power that's totally astonishing. He's able to endow his subject with, with, with that kind of regal power, I think by projecting himself, actually. Does every it... painter want that, in a, in a sense that to control and to own and to, to create something which is that singular, then? You'd want to make those paintings, yeah. I don't think you'd, I don't know if I'd want to be that person, that, that such a person, 
I, I have no idea what it would be like, but I would love to be, have made those paintings. <laughs> By the 1640s, Velázquez had risen in the hierarchy at court and was now not only the personal painter to the king, but was also in charge of buying paintings and furniture for all the royal palaces. What he became was, in effect, Philip IV's curator, and together they assembled a quite remarkable collection of paintings. When Velasquez was in his 20s, the king sent him to Italy at the suggestion of Rubens to study the great Renaissance masters. The visit transformed his own style and had a profound impact on his understanding of painting. This picture, known as Joseph's Bloody Coat, was painted on that visit in 1629. Together, he and the king acquired an extraordinary number of masterpieces, including works by Rubens, Titian and Tintoretto. They also devised a revolutionary new way of hanging pictures according to their subject and their style. These rooms and their scorial are in many ways the first modern art galleries. In 1649, 20 years after his first visit, Philip IV sent Velázquez back to Italy to buy more paintings and other works of art. Velázquez's second trip to Italy lasted over two years, and most of it was spent here in Rome. He supervised the copying of classical sculptures and bought paintings to decorate the royal palaces in Spain. But much of his time was also spent cultivating powerful contacts, particularly in the church. In his 40s, Velázquez began to harbour ambitions to join the ranks of the Spanish aristocracy. Other painters, including Titian and Rubens, had been knighted by Spanish kings, but Velázquez knew that any investigation would uncover his tainted Jewish blood and that he could only be ennobled with special dispensation, almost certainly from the Pope. In order to strengthen his hand in Rome and add to his growing reputation, he arranged to paint a portrait of the Pope himself, the recently elected Cardinal Giovanni Pamphili, who had taken the title Innocent X. There he is, Pope Innocent X, at the age of 76. Famous not just for the power he wielded, he was also famously ugly. Too ugly, possibly, to be Pope, that's what some of the cardinals thought. Velasquez has really captured this fierce personality, his intelligence, his ruthlessness, the enormous power that he wielded, power that was both spiritual and temporal. It's extraordinarily lifelike, this painting. It's almost frightening. Those reds are so, so dazzling. <laughs> it's as if they're emanating a heat in this very small room. And yet it's that face that you're drawn to. It seems to be challenging Velasquez. But we know that he admired this picture. He placed it outside his office in the Vatican. English painter Francis Bacon was obsessed with this picture. He thought it was one of the greatest portraits ever. And he painted a series of variations on it in which the Pope is screaming, as if trapped in his own kind of hell. Velázquez was now at the height of his powers, and his visit to Rome, which was nominally a shopping trip in the service of the king, was to produce not only his mesmerizing portrait of Innocent X, but an equally powerful and provocative work, 
a portrait of a slave, his slave, Juan de Parejo. In May 1650, when the picture was exhibited in the Pantheon in Rome, it caused a sensation. A commentator wrote, the crowd stood looking at the painted portrait and the model with admiration and amazement, not knowing which one they should speak to and which was to answer. Everything else seemed like painting, but this alone seemed like truth. What makes this painting even more fascinating is that Juan de Pareja was not only Velázquez's slave, but also his studio assistant and a painter in his own right. Would it have been surprising that this is a painting of a slave? Very definitely. In fact, in all of 17th century in European painting, it's a very rare subject because slaves obviously were the lowest order and were not considered to be, let's say, picture worthy. So there's something of a challenge that he issues here in saying, I'm going to make a portrait unlike you've ever seen before, and my subject is going to be somebody that you don't even believe to be worthy of, of, of a master's touch. Would it have identified the fact that Juan de Bereja was a, a slave? At the, would they have known? They would have known by the color of his skin. So the, he's, he's called Moorish. He's obviously of Arab descent. My favorite bit of this painting, I have to tell you, is this ear, <laughs> which yeah. is hardly anything at all. It's just a little deposit of kind of an orangish pigment. And you see earlobe, and you read earlobe, and the whole ear takes shape, and all he's done is put that little dot. But what makes the picture so unusual is that he's showing him as if he were a free man. It's a noble pose. It's a very lively, energetic pose. This arm and the hand. It's the hand. I noticed the hand. The hand seems a man of status. Yeah. You almost feel he must know he's not going to be a slave for long no, it, in that posture. Yeah, there's something, you know, very self-assertive. Yeah. I keep seeing this parallel with Velasquez, you know, who wants to be ennobled. He's served the king all this time. He has a self-regard that... I never thought of that, but I think you're right. I think that's a very good point indeed. In fact, Velázquez gave Juan de Pareja his freedom towards the end of his stay in Rome in 1650. But his own hopes of preferment still hung in the balance, despite his efforts to ingratiate himself with the Pope. But there's another thing about this painting and about this encounter with Pope Innocent X, in his left hand, he's holding a piece of paper. That piece of paper is a petition, and on it is Velasquez's signature. He uses his full name, Diego de Silva y Velasquez, and it's almost certainly a request for the Pope's support for his claim to join the nobility in Spain. But even with this audacious endorsement, it was to be another nine years before he achieved his goal. Despite letters from Philip IV demanding that he return to Madrid, Velázquez stayed in Rome for nearly three years. A document found recently in a Roman archive reveals a possible reason why. In 1650, Velázquez makes provision for a wet nurse to care for his infant son, Antonio. There is no other reference to the boy who may not have lived beyond infancy, or to the woman who gave birth to Velasquez's illegitimate child. Velasquez's only surviving nude, the Roque B. Venus, is thought to have been painted at precisely this time. Is she, perhaps, a portrait of the woman who became his mistress in Rome? And might this explain why this is one of the most sensual and mysterious paintings of all time? Is it a sexy painting, Tom? It's sexy as painting. You know, an artist would think, well, that's really sexy kind of painting. But, uh, and I suppose the fact that it's done with, uh, you know, such cool passion, if one can say that, and that seems to be what's always going on in, in Velasquez. He engages 
everybody is in control, which is something that's quite difficult to do. Uh, it's got that cool passion. And you can inhabit it with your own passion because it's open to that. So it's a wonderful picture. He's playing his piano of color perfectly in perfect modulation. He's got everything under control. You feel an impulse to move ever closer to see more how he's done that. Uh, you're the expert, does not How has he done that? What, how is that? that? Those flesh colors, that is astonishing. I know people come here every day and look at this, but it is amazing. Really yes. amazing. It's phenomenal modeling and virtually seamless on the back. And then everything around is brushwork. Up close, at least, is brushwork. And you get this little bit of fabric right across, and yet from a distance, it plays as, as her flesh sinking into this. He's already into this mode where when you get to the edges of, of normal vision, it just kind of yeah. fades out. The, the leg of the cherub, the cherub is all around. Velasquez abandoned his mistress and infant son to return to his family and his official duties in Madrid. He was increasingly a civil servant looking after the king's household. His main task as a painter was to portray the royal children. Philip IV's adored son and heir, Balthazar Carlos, died tragically and unexpectedly at the age of 17. His next son, Prince Felipe Prospero, seen here at the age of two, was a sickly child. He died only two years later, at the age of four. From now on, Velázquez's most frequent sitter would be the king's youngest daughter, the little Infanta Margarita. Unlike her siblings, she survived to become the empress of the Austrian Habsburg dynasty. Philip IV blamed himself for the private and public difficulties that colored the end of his reign, and he became even more reclusive and remote. In all probability, this is the last portrait that Velazquez makes of the king. Very, very tersely painted, big, broad strokes modeling that face. That face is sort of nearly liquefies. It's sort yes, of... very thinly painted. Whatever else, it looks like he's been through it. <laughs> yes, he's, he's been through it as king and, and also as a father and husband as well. He's lost a wife, he's lost a, a series of children, and he really becomes kind of morbid the older he gets. And he develops a relationship with a nun, and he tells her that, that he has not wished to have himself portrayed by Velasquez's acute eye for many years right. and it's only under a certain amount of pressure that that he agrees to allow his portrait to be taken again he's worried about himself aging and worried that this realist painter mm -hmm. who is so acute indeed might just capture this it's one of the most sensitive portraits of the king most of them are so totally inscrutable um, and this is not. No, that whatever mask there is yes. with Philip, it's sort of dropped here, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Bit by bit, as you get older as a painter, you can do most of the things that painters do. But there's always a gap, and that gap is the widest when you come to Velasquez. That last picture was in the National Gallery, the uh, Philip IV in old age. You try and find where one colour turns into the other, and you can't spot it and it's painted, you know, what we call a la prima, which is painted directly while it's wet, so everything merges in one into the other. I can't pin down where it happens, that is magic, you know, where the sorcery is performed. The king commissioned a final painting from Velázquez, which he hung in his own apartments and was meant for his private contemplation. It captures an instant in the life of the palace so perfectly 
but it seems to transport you back to the court which Velasquez chronicled for nearly 40 years. Las Meninas is Velázquez's final gift to his king. It depicts the world that they shared with an informality that seems utterly effortless. More has been written about this painting than about almost any other. At one level, it's simply a marvelous portrait of the five-year-old Infanta Margarita with her maids in attendance. But it's also a painting about painting a sophisticated reflection on the nature of appearance and reality, a complex exercise in perspective, and even a justification for both Velázquez's own social ambitions and the status of painting itself. By the time Las Meninas was painted in 1656, Velázquez had been in the service of Philip IV for more than 30 years. But despite a lifetime at court, he'd still failed to achieve the status he felt he deserved. In 17th century Spain, painting was regarded as a trade. And regardless of his intimacy with the king, a humble painter with possible Jewish blood was not considered fit to join the ranks of the aristocracy. Nevertheless, in 1658, Velázquez formally applied to join one of the grandest military orders in Spain. After an official investigation, which heard evidence from 148 witnesses, his application was eventually rejected. And it took two papal dispensations before he was finally admitted into the order of the Knights of Santiago in November, 1659. That visit to Pope Innocent X had clearly paid off. And that's how Four years after Las Meninas was painted, the Red Cross of the Knights of Santiago found its way onto Velázquez's chest. Did he paint it himself, or was it, as some historians assert, put there on the orders of the king? We don't know. We can only speculate. Velázquez died just one year later, on the 9th of August, 1660, at the age of 61. He was buried with the insignia of Santiago emblazoned on his chest. The rise and fall of a Roman sculptor, Simon Sharma, profiles Bernini in The Power of Art on Friday at 9 on BBC Two.